What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the 585 Report. Mitch Broder alongside Ryan Sullivan. And uh, we wish we could be talking to you guys under some different circumstances, obviously, but uh, such is not the case. Before we even get into it, uh, any of our conversation here, Ryan, let me ask you, how, how are you holding up after the game? Because it's been, for those, you know, we record on Tuesday night, so it's been about 48 hours uh, since the game. How, how are you feeling right now? So I feel like I've gotten better as I've gotten older of, of limiting the sadness that professional sports teams can bring me. But Monday, I was very sad. I was, right. it, it was, Monday was uh, tough. But also because I, I'm sure if you listen to this, you may have experienced the same thing. That if you have friends, you know, as you move out, as you get older, you make friends who aren't Bills fans. And I had all my friends from college, from work, from all these other people who know me as Ryan the Bills fan reaching out to me like my dog died or something. Are you okay? How are you feeling? And like, that's almost worse. Like I, like I rather you just rub it in my face than, than that. I love them. I love everyone who reached out, but Holy moly, that one, it, it, it was something about that one. I tried to, I tried to pair it up with, with game teams losses that, that felt made me feel sad. And there was a couple of Syracuse basketball teams that should have been good that got knocked out early on that, that really rocked me. The, the 2017 ALCS Yankees really rocked me, but I, I really can't think of a loss that was as, as emotional as this one. A hundred percent. And, and it's funny you mentioned that I, the same thing happened to me because, you know, I go to school in Pennsylvania. So I'm surrounded by, you know, people who are from New York, people from Pennsylvania, people who are from you know all over the place. And I had people up, up until tonight, Ryan, I still have people asking me how, how who haven't seen me since the game. Like, you doing all right? You know, but I agree. The older I've got, I mean, I've, 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 I was obviously in the moment very upset. I mean, how can you not be? I mean, I mean, that was from you and me, Ryan, from being drought kids, if you will. Like, that was our first real just gut wrencher of a Bills loss because I mean, I don't know about you. I was like five months old during the Music City Miracle, so I don't think I really knew, the, of the course, only- what's going on. The only other game that really made me feel this bad was it's a really weird one. I you can't really compare it because it was a regular season game. But the only other game that compares like this for me was there was a the 2014 season coming off beating the Packers mm-hmm. and then going in and losing to the rookie three win Raiders. And it turned out it didn't matter. They wouldn't have made the playoffs if they had won out. But that was one that that at that point was we had been on such a high. And to hit that low well, was upsetting, but that's the only thing I really have to, to, to even compare to that when it comes to Bills losses. Right. You know, so this, I mean, for a lot of us, I mean, for, for a whole generation of people our age, I mean, this is their, our first times dealing with this. You know, our parents dealt with, you know, or if you or friends with older Bills fans, they've dealt with the Music City Miracle. They dealt with, you know, with, with the Super Bowl losses. I mean, this is really our first taste of that. And, you know, it's definitely... It, it, but I agree with you. As I've gotten older, I have been able to move on from it a little bit better than if I were, you know, a few years younger. I think I would have still been in a pretty horrible mood. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, just just a tough game for sure. And um, although, you know, again, I, I, I'm sure you know, Ryan, you're still upset. I am getting a little bit of um, like solace in a way, or I don't know if that's the right word, but really, I'm starting to turn around a little bit from just kind of thinking about like where the bills currently are as far as as a team and at their quarterback position, because the one positive that we can, everyone can take off from this game is there is no question about it. Not only do the bills have their dude at quarterback, but they have one of like the dudes at quarterback. And that to know that you have yourself a guy who, I mean, there's people saying Ryan on that, that, you know, yesterday and today that, if his career goes as well as, as we think it should, I mean, we could be talking about a Hall of Fame player. And to have that under center, I don't think can be taken lightly at all. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it the Bills will constantly be in the running for a playoffs. Like, I, I see a lot of lamenting. Their window's closing, their window's almost closing. The, this next year's the last smallish cap hit for Josh Allen goes up to 16 million. And that's not the case. If you have a guy, and for the next 15 years, right, you know, you got to assume Brady is, is five years or less in this league. I know it looks like he'll be playing, but he's on his way out. Rodgers, 
you know, you don't know how much he has left or where he's going to go after the Packers if he's able to find signs that says there. If your quarterback isn't Josh Allen, Pat Mahomes, Justin Herbert, Lamar Jackson, you got to ask yourself some really, really tough questions right now. Or Joe Burrow, too. Joe Burrow. If you don't have one of those five quarterbacks right now, there is a lot of tough questions you really have to ask yourself. And because that is a gauntlet of freakish and Joe Burrow is a little less talent, you know, naturally gifted, but still a fantastic quarterback who's playing this weekend. And just the talent and the, the, the skills and the traits that these five guys have is remarkable. So it, if you want to take something out of this game, take out that, that the Bills will always have a seat at this table, you know, unless they go full, full Seahawks where they never invest in offensive line or full Packers where they never invest in wide receivers. But even then having a guy like this is going to carry you. Now, before we do anything, I want to rant for one second. Something that's really been bugging me. And I feel like, I feel like I can do this because I've been, harping on this train for a while now. I was mad about this in 2018 when it happened to the Chiefs. Well, Ryan, you can't complain about the the overtime rules. You should have you should have gotten a stop. Yes. The Bills should have stopped them. The Bills should not have let and we're going to get into that whole sequence. Bills should have stopped them. Bills should have had shouldn't have let them go 40 yards in 13 seconds. Absolutely. That is correct. That doesn't mean the overtime rules are good. That doesn't mean we should keep the overtime rules the way they are. It is ridiculous. I said the same thing. I wasn't active on Twitter back then, but when it happened in this stadium in 2018 with the Patriots, I said the same thing. You should not have a playoff game of all games, especially when you have a game like that where Josh Allen scores with 13 seconds left and he never touches the ball again and loses. That is, I don't care that the walk off, I don't care about that stuff. And, People want to come up with these new rules, you know, kind of make a college. I think college is perfect. Don't maybe don't start the 25 like they do in college or 35, whatever it is. Push it back to the 50, push it back to the 40, whatever it is. It, this the rules that you have a game like that and, and you don't let one guy touch the ball in overtime is insanity to me. Call me salty, but I, I've been on that train for a while. And you've been on and I've been on that this Twitter this year, and I know. Mitch, maybe you have a different opinion because you sat through the monstrosity that was Penn State, Illinois this year. And right. I'm not saying we have to bastardize over time to that point where we're doing two point conversions to win the game. But right. I think I think that's a vastly more fair system than what we have now. All right, no, Ryan, I'm actually happy you brought this up because for, first of all, I think I think Bruce exclusive, you know, has, has put it perfectly on Twitter. He's been saying that, listen. Both can be true that the Bills should have gotten a stop and that the overtime rules are a disaster. Both are true. There's no question about it. And at the end of the day, I, I really believe, Ryan, what it should be is just one quarter. You play out like any other quarter. And whatever the result is, the end of that quarter is the game. Period. I don't think there should be any of this, well, touchdown or no. Give both teams a chance to possess the football because I know people say, well, not every drive, not every team that wins the coin toss is going to win the game. But in a game of that magnitude, to have it end where Josh Allen never gets the football back, it's just like, it's just why? Like, what are we doing? You know, the Chiefs defense weren't going to stop either. Like, the Chiefs no, defense it, it, were not going to get a stop. That, listen, that game, say what there. you want. That, that, that game came down to a coin toss. It's whoever, because I, I mean, I said it right there. I said, whatever offense gets the ball is winning this football game. Because both defenses were toast at the end of that one. So, no, I agree with you. I think, I think. listen, I don't think change is going to happen now. But I really do hope that someday, you know, the 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 owners can get together and vote to to change these overtime rules. Because think about it. I mean, they, they changed the extra point to make that more fair and competitive. Why not do that to overtime also? You know, like they've made already changes kind of in that vein. Um, so I agree with you, Ryan. I, I really do think they need to... They have to change the the overtime rules because it really is just doesn't make sense for what it is. Yeah, and it's crazier right. to think that it used to be a field goal, too. Yeah, like, yeah. I, not that and up till like recently, I remember watching games where you could just go down and get to the four, you know, thirty five yard line and kick a field goal to end the game. It, it it just seems counter to to everything football is. And 
you know, maybe you do some of those things, you end up with less ties, right? You know, get rid of the, you know, we don't want ties in football. So it seems like, you know, it, it, it sounds like me being salty, but I, I've been on this train for a while and a game where it happens to me, it just exacerbates that desire. Right. right. So again, as we, you know, we talked about the overtime, but we do need to kind of backtrack if you will. Um, with with the because we got to talk about the last 13 seconds i mean that's what this game i mean that's what it's being called it's now 13 seconds that's the name of it and it's one that i think bills fans are we're going to think about for a long time i've already thought about in my head multiple times well what if they did this or that or what if they could have made that at the end of the day like they met you know the bills blew it in those 13 seconds and i guess ryan like where is do you put the blame do you put on the players do you put on the coaches if so which players which coaches like where's the finger being pointed after these 13 seconds so i i, I want to i think there's a discussion that had be had about mcdermott's comments today but i want to save that for kind of the end of this little segment here and you know i, I think i, I want to be fair right i think i am a mcdermott the show tends to come off as mcdermott apologist and whatever went wrong falls on the coaches, whether it, whether it was a communication issue, whether it was, whether it was a, uh, the way they, what they told them to do, right. Whether it was a communication issue, stuff like that falls on the coaches. Now I think there's some important context that, that gets lost in this discussion, right? When, when they went out the kick and I'm in a minority, like and I'm in, I'm, maybe I'm in a minority and I know I'm in a minority on this. When they went out the kick that, Let's put it in context. What happened earlier in that, not that long ago in that game, they gave up a big return on a punt to Tyreek Hill, right? So I don't blame them for not wanting to kick to a guy, right? The play devil's advocate to everyone saying you should have squibbed. If they, let's say that squib doesn't get past, you know, the second, you know, the second to last line and they get the ball to the 35, 40 yard line and you have nine seconds, but now you're 15, 10, 15 yards closer to where you need to go. Was that three or four seconds worth it? Something to consider. It also seems, you know, if you listen to McDermott's comments today, it sounds like Tyler Bass may have been asked to kick it short. Something that he's done before. We've seen Tyler Bass intentionally keep kick short throughout a game. To, to limit returns and force guys to get their hands on the ball. It's maybe, you know, I, I think there's a reasonable case we made based on McDermott's comments. It sounded like he was, you know, he's not someone who who's out, who will throw guys under the bus, right? It sounds like he was protecting something or someone that may have been outside of him. And the team, so I think that's reasonable, right? I, I don't think it's this cut and dry thing that, oh, if they squibbed it, they would have won. Or if they kicked it short, it would have won. Because they would have had to make a tackle. They they had had some issues on special teams in that game, right? But, you know, I think there probably would have, should have been some effort to get rid of, to, to try to take some time off on that kickoff. See, that, I, I think that is probably what Brandon Bean, or not, excuse me, what Sean McDermott wanted was for Bass to pooch that ball up super duper high, have it drop it like the goal line and just have all the special teams guys crashing in. I think that's probably what he wanted. And that's what I would have personally done. I see. I agree with you, right? I don't think the squib kick would have been the right call because also squib kicks. I mean, they don't know the bounces that ball can take. If that thing goes out of balance and you get the cheese of the ball, they're at your, at their 40. I mean, that's even worse, frankly. And that still would mean no time coming off the clock. So I don't a hundred percent, agree that that should have been a swift kick but i do think the bill should have caused a return of some sorts because at the end of the day the time was the biggest thing just 13 seconds just get that clock down as little as you can and although till you know tyree kill did hurt them on a punt return i mean the bills kick coverage the whole season had been pretty damn good and they faced some pretty good returners before the chiefs game so i I, again, who knows who, whether that was McDermott who wanted that ball to the end zone, whether that was Bass screwing that one up. We'll never know. And McDermott's, like you said, McDermott's never going to throw his players under the bus. He'll, you know, he'll protect his players at all costs. So we'll never really know the answer to it. But I, I, I do think that they should have pooched the ball up there. But to be honest, Ryan, that's not the thing that upsets me the most about that sequence at all. 
Because at the end of the day, in the moment, I wasn't that upset with him kicking it through the back of the end zone just to ensure no return. I think what really has to be talked about are those two calls that they had for, their, for, for the defense on those two plays. I mean, they played pretty much Hail Mary protect the sideline defense, which is fine when the team only has a timeout or zero timeouts. But the Chiefs had all three timeouts. And I just, I just don't, for the life of me, understand what the logic was for that decision to be made. Right. You know, again, like the kickoff, I think there's some context to go along with this, right? I I, I don't think it clearly was not the right defense to be played in that situation. But once again, I don't think it was this cut and dry, right? People came out and say, well, why don't you just go out, play your normal defense, playing prevent defenses, preventing a win. Okay. Well, look what happened when we tried to play normal defense literally like 30 seconds ago, Tyree kill ran through that normal defense for, for a touchdown. Right. So, Oh, I think I just set off my Siri in here. Um, sorry, that scared me. Someone was talking at me for a second here. <laughs> um, anyways, you, you saw Tyreek Hill run through that normal defense. I don't know what happened, right? You you do the thing where you you rush two guys, right? Tommy Romo was saying you should rush two guys or three guys and then drop an extra guy into coverage. And I mean, maybe that was the right call. Maybe you push Ty, uh Travis Kelsey off the line, right? But, you know, I, I don't think there's this cut and dry thing that said, hey, if they had done this, it would have worked, right? Obviously, what they did wasn't smart. And once again, whether that was a coaching issue, whether, you know, I, I don't want, I don't, you know, you watch the back shot of that play to Kelsey. I, I refuse to believe that they were t- letting, telling them to let them get right. give that much space, right? I, I refuse to believe that that was the play call, whether that was communication from, from Frazier to Wallace, whether that was communication from McDermott to Frazier, whatever it was, something got lost there. Something got lost in translation. Something got lost in communication. And when you're playing against an alien in, in Patrick Mahomes and one of the most talented pass catching units in the league, you know, you just can't have slip ups like that, right? You, You never think it it was just unprecedented, but Patrick Mahomes and this team is an unprecedented team. And that's the thing I think like, because McDermott, I mean, he said it in the press conference um, today, I believe, you know, he said uh, the last 13 seconds, that was execution. And I will, uh, I will say too, you know, something, and again, we're talking about who, who do you blame? I mean, of course I personally do put, I think most of the blame on Frazier and McDermott, but you also watch that. It's like, why is Levi Wallace not reacting quicker, seeing that Kelsey has got some separation, that Mahomes is just staring him down? You know, and that's where I think the execution comes into play there a little bit because the players got to recognize at the end of the day, Hill and Kelsey are the two guys you just have to make sure don't get the ball because those are guys who can catch it and get you close to that field goal. So, you know, if you're asking me who, who I blame again, I think I put it about three quarters of it on coaching because you do have to put your players in the right position. And and who knows what that position was, but I think we can agree it wasn't what was called on those two plays. But I think you do have to put a little bit on the players because they didn't tackle in space. You know, they let, the, you know, Hill and Kelsey get some yards after the catch. You know, they didn't react quick enough and, and you know, and try to at least just make the catch a little harder, maybe, you know, bat the ball away and complete. So that's kind of how I stand about who gets blamed for those 13 seconds. I, I, I'm leaning more towards the coaches, but I don't think the players get off the hook without anything. I do think you have to put a little on their plates as well. Right, right. And and it it's such a one in a million thing that happened. And, you know, it's just, there's maybe maybe one or two of the quarterbacks who could have That's even taken thing. advantage yep. of a thing like that too. And, you know, you it, it, it's like a it's like a home run hitter in baseball, right? You have to if if you give them a curveball down the middle, nine times out of ten they're going to hit a home run, and you know that's what happened. They they, they threw a curveball to a slugger and left in the middle of the plate, and it's things now. I I'm going to absolve them of the overtime defense, right? I, I think there's a lot yeah. of all of a sudden backlash towards Frazier. We're going to talk about Frazier in a minute here, but that defense was gas, man. Like I, I don't blame them because once again i don't think kansas city was going to get a stop either right kansas city just let them storm down the field twice and essentially have two game-winning drives this defense 
was understandably gassed. And you'll, you kind of see that in games like this, right? Where these shootouts where neither of the defense can get a stop. You saw that in that 2018 <laughs> playoff game that, that kind of, in some ways, mimic our AFC championship game that kind of mirrored this game for the Chiefs, right? That, that at the end of the game, the, the defense, neither of the defenses were going to do anything. You saw that in that Super Bowl with, with the Bear, with the Falcons and the Patriots. Neither of those defenses were going to get a stop. Right by the end of this game, I don't think there was much. I, I don't care if you had Ed Reed, Ray Lewis, the the great all, all Hall of Fame defense out there. They were gassed, and, and there's not a whole lot you can do when you get to that point of the game. But it, looking at the other side of the ball, this is probably Brian Dable's last game in Buffalo. I I it by all by the time this releases he could be the head coach really carting this Tuesday night at 9 56 right now by the time this re- drops Wednesday at noon Brian Dable could be the head coach of the Giants he just had a second interview it, all indications are that he's gonna be the guy Joe Shane is there now so I, I think that if it's not Giants it's gonna be some you gotta imagine it's gonna be someone else the Bills just had a historical offensive uh postseason here even though even if it's only two games he's gonna be somewhere and for Brian Dable in, the, in this last real appearance as Buffalo's offensive coordinator, how what what were your how do you think the offense did? Because I they would I think there were points to be frustrated, but you know I, they also I thought they also did some really good things in this game. So real quick before I answer that question, it's funny you just said that because I actually just got a notification that the Giants just scheduled a second interview with Leslie Frazier for Friday. So, okay, interesting. Uh, so I guess uh, Dable Maybe not. will still be up in the air. But um, going back to little Brian Dable, listen, I, I gave him overall at a 10. I give him a 7 out of 10. I think he generally did call a good game. Of course, there were definitely some moments in the game that I that I didn't like. The, the one drive to me, Ryan, that, that I think was a killer for Buffalo, it was a 3 and out, and it went past a Reggie Gilliam run to Singletary, run to McKenzie, three and out punt. And that that was a, that was one that, you know, again, we we've it feels like as as good as Brian Dable is as a play caller and an offensive coordinator, and I really do believe he is. He does sometimes I think get in kind of these lulls a little bit. And I think that they did hit one this game, which was unfortunate to see just because this offense was just executing just rapid nonstop for weeks and weeks and weeks. But overall, listen, I, I don't think you could put much blame on Brian Dable. At the end of the day, the Bills put up 36 points and had over 400 yards of offense. I mean, how, you know, you can't be upset with that effort. I mean, if you told me before the game, that was what the Bills offense was going to do. I would have told you, I like the Bills chances to win the game, you know, with that. But Again, I, I give him a seven out of ten. I also think some of the plays, there's no question that, and this and this is what happens when you have a guy like Josh Allen. You know, like he just keeps the play alive when it looks dead, makes it out of something when it's you know not there, uh, or at least when it doesn't look like anything's there. So, was it Dable's best game? No. Am I upset with the effort he put out there on 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 Sunday night? Absolutely not. I think Dable is completely fine. I don't really think you could put much blame on him, if any. You know, of note in this game, they didn't kick anytime they went to the red zone they didn't have to attempt any field goals right i think like you said i think you nailed in the head i think there was a point in this game where they had a really solid opportunity to to dictate this game and it was they got the midfield i think they punted on fourth and four which i would have gone for it at that point but they punted on fourth and four pinned them at like the one forced the three and out inside the 10 got the ball around midfield ran it three times and punted and I thought that was a spot where they really could have started to dictate the energy and the direction of that game and I think that was definitely something where they let an opportunity slip slip away they I think in that and that three on those three plays they they kept Stefan Diggs on the sideline for all three of those plays which is which is never acceptable um but if you want to talk process, you know, the thought process, you know, this was a team that wasn't good at defending the run. I don't necessarily blame them for thinking they could get the run going in this game and maybe allow the offense to be on the field longer, force Pat Mahomes to stay off the field. So I don't necessarily blame the thought process there. And then there was the three, there was a three and out in the third quarter coming off, a, a, coming off a stop where they, that they could have, 
got back in the game. I think they got the three and out on that McKenzie burnt uh that they got he got beat on an end around. And I think, you know, every once in a while he gets too cute. And you know, to your point, I think at times, especially in a game like this, it can be hard to decouple the what's Josh and what's stable. But I think he put him in places to succeed. He he you know, he you know that first drive was spectacular. You know, guys were running open on both both of the game winning drives, right? So he, there is credit for Dable there, and I think if if you're a head coach or if you're an organization, a GM, and you're looking at how that game ended up, I think you're feeling good about your decision, and I think you have to feel good about what he brought um, in that game because I, I don't think that. I, I don't know what else you can really expect, right? Obviously, you want to score every drive, but that's not realistic. I think they punted three times mm-hmm. in this game, and they prop, you know, one, you know, they they get five or six yards on that, you know, and that, they get a first down on that at first that series in the first quarter where they pinned them deep and got the ball back, and maybe we're talking about playing the Bengals at home this week. So it, you know, it really in a game where the margins are thin like that, you, you got to have those, but. That's just the way it happens sometimes. And, and and not to mention, too, you know, I know people, I mean, a criticism of Dable, and deservedly so, has been sometimes he gets too cute. But, like, look at Andy Reid. I mean, like, I don't think people are, if this game goes the other way, I think Chiefs fans are going nuts that he called a, a an option play with his third string tight end at the goal line that completely backfired, you know, earlier in the game. So, like, it just goes to show, like, listen, even the best of the best sometimes, you know, get too cute and try to do a little bit too much, you know, and a guy like Andy Reid. So, right, overall, I don't I, – I think they will get enough – you know, put this offense in a good enough position um, to win the game. As we always do, Ryan, though, we have to go through our kind of game uh, moments, if you will, our rewards, our – I don't know – we we I don't know, we don't really have a real official name for this category here, but for the last time, you know what what was the turning point in this game for you? Where where do you feel like this game changed? I said it. I I think now, obviously, the thirteen outside of the thirteen seconds, right? For me, I, it it was that first drive. Like it was early on, but but the 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 situation where they pinned them deep, got to stop and went three and out from midfield. I, I think that really, really hurt. That was such a, such a huge opportunity, such a massive opportunity for them to, to, like I said, dictate the direction of this game, dictate the energy of this game, even just get a field goal out of that. They, they let that slip through their hands. And for me, you know, when, when I watched that happen, it was one of the, as I was watching, I said, oh, I was like, you got to have that. You you have to mm-hmm. take points when you get the ball in that spot. And um, and there was, you know, I think there was one other spot where the only other spot I had. Well, I'll I'll save that. I'll I won't in case I'm taking yours. Um, you might be. I don't know. I mean, I mean, for me, I wrote somewhat as a joke. You know, the coin flip. Um, obviously, but um, the moment I felt like that this, you know, things that this game really had flipped. Um, uh, was that. Uh, touched out a Tyreek Hill when he just blew by the defense. And the reason why I'm picking that play in particular um, was just because it was kind of at that moment, Ryan, where I officially said the Bills defense is toast. They just don't, they just can't. I mean, they're not going to get a stop anymore. And that's where you, you know, you knew the Bills had to win this game in, in regulation. Couldn't let this game possibly get to overtime with the Mahomes having the ball just because I think that play just symbolized how gassed they were how much they were struggling with Tyreek Hill, who had another excellent game against them. And on top of the fact that how difficult it is, really, I mean, I know the Chiefs had their ups and downs this year, but when they're on, I mean, they are as hard as anybody to defend with the just absolute specimens they have on their offense. And Tyreek Hill being, I mean, one of one. There There are no receivers like that guy in the NFL with his speed. So to me, that's kind of where... I started to sort of panic because the defense before that, although they were bending, they weren't breaking. They were forcing some field goals. They were getting off the field a little bit, but that felt like the moment where they officially kind of broke. And you sort of knew after that, they weren't ever going to 
get get it back together. So for me, that is kind of the turning point of the game that that I had. Yep, yep. Now, what is what what's your LVP in this game? It's kind of it, it was kind of hard to sort through this one. I'm curious who you who you have. It, it was. You know what? I'm gonna go. I had one I was gonna say, but I, I think I'm gonna go in a different direction with this. Actually, I'm gonna go with the Bills. Um, the Bills front four. And although they pressured Mahomes, right, the whole goal of the Bills bolstering up that D line was not just to get pressure on Mahomes, who's great throwing on the run. It was to get Mahomes down, get sacks, and make it so that they get negative plays because it's hard to get them against the Chiefs. And at the end of the day, the Bills got one sack, and it was on Taron Johnson pushing Mahomes out of bounds on a scramble. That was it. And I know the D line, you know, they were this close to having a few game changing plays, but. When it's that time in the playoffs, you got to have those plays. And it's concerned to me, Ryan, that this this the Bills, and we again we can maybe talk about this a little bit later in the show, but it's a little concerning that they they put so many resources into this defensive line. And at the end of the day, in the game that they were meant to sort of be at their best and why they were put together, they felt kind of flat. They didn't get the job done, you know. And I just think that the back seven held up as well as they could have. And this game, and they needed that front four to just get Mahomes to the turf a few times, and they just never did. So for me, my LVP is that Bills defensive line. I made a joke during this season that I feel like, if you remember that 2019 season, the Bills had Jordan Phillips, and he got, I think, 10 and a half sacks Mm -hmm. in that season. But if you go back and you look at those sacks, he wasn't getting a ton of pressures. He had a lot of cleanup, a lot of things that kind of got walked into him. And I made a joke that it feels like this team who is, I think, second in the ended up second in the league, third in the league in pressures and hurries and, and those stats had an inability to finish sacks. And it felt like they were they were paying this cosmic debt for for the season that got Jordan Phillips paid and the success Jordan Phillips had that season. And, you know, it, it's a trend that, you know, throughout the offseason, I'm going to try to sort out because I don't quite understand it, that a team that. It's so good at getting pressure. That is so good. Cause you know, there were times like there was a number of times where Greg Rousseau walked his guy back into Mahomes. There was a number of times where Ed Oliver beat the interior of this offensive line. There were opportunities to make plays in this game. Part of that, once again, you know, Mahomes had a really good game scrambling, right. but and it, he's hard to take down. But yeah, and but Robo made the point during the game that there were times where they also got too far upfield. So you know, as we talk off season, probably next, you know, more next week, you know, I, I would love, love, love to eat, whether it, whether it's a coaching point, whether it's someone they got to bring in just finishing plays, right? If they could finish even like 5% more of these plays, it's a really terrifying pass rush. And I think what what's upsetting about this loss is you saw how bad that Bengals line was. And, you feel like that Bills and Joe Burrow is not nearly as as mobile as as Patrick Mahomes. And when there are pressures, you know, if you look at the season, get sacked, right? So that's what part what makes it because you feel like that defensive line really could have ate in that game against the Bengals. But for me, it, like I said, I want to be honest. I'm putting this out here because I want to I want to be fair and I'm being a McDermott apologist, but I'm going to say the coaching staff, right? Ultimately, mm-hmm. those 13 seconds come down to the coaching staff and I'm still supportive of this coaching staff. If you're someone who's saying McDermott needs to be fired after this, right. Have a fair, take a breath, take a nap, have relax because that's not the case. And he's going to learn from this. Right. And I don't want to be reactionary, but he has to learn from this, right? This, this wasn't his best showing. He got beat by Andy Reid again. And it's second straight season where this has happened in Arrowhead. And obviously this was a lot closer they beat him an arrowhead before this year, right? So they're getting closer. So it's not like there hasn't been progress, but he needs to keep getting better. And he can't, he, you know, the, the more games that happen like this, you know, the more these questions are going to be raised about, can he win one score games, right? Oh, oh, and six and one score games, right? It's statistically improbable, but you know, when, when it keeps happening, you know, it is a pattern, but the, the wrap up the thought on that, and the guy across the field, the guy across the field from him, I think we forget how much he was memed for not being able to figure out end of game situations. And I do think we need to 
if you if you watch other games, I think you will realize just about every coach, even Belichick sometimes, but you know, outside of like the Belichicks, kind of struggles with with game management to a point, right? The, the grass isn't a lot greener, right. but they take that up. He's going to have to be better, point blank period. So that he gets he gets my LVP for this game. And, and deservedly so. I mean, I, I I think that it's very fair to be critical of Sean McDermott. I agree with you. The people who want him fired, I think, need to simmer down a little bit because winning the playoffs is not easy. And I think people also forget. I mean, McDermott, I know this is, you know, five years in the process, but this is McDermott's fifth year being a head coach ever. So it, it takes a little time to learn from this. And again, you hope that he absolutely learns from these mistakes he's made in the playoffs over the last two years and and gets better. Um but no, he does deserve some criticism because at the end of the day, his game plan on defense, you know, and I, and, and that's the thing. I had Leslie Frazier listed as, you know, another guy by LVP. So I guess we kind of combine the two together right, right here. You know, their game plan didn't work against, against Mahomes again. And I think that's fair to criticize them for that. Um, so I, I, I think it's a valid point there. How about your MVP, though? I mean, I, th- I feel like there's really only two guys you could pick for this. So I'll let you go first. Yeah, um, we can I see if anything can, surprising. We, we, can, we can use this to talk about both guys so i feel like one of us will pick the other but for me I, I'll, I'll take the take the quarterback josh allen mm-hmm. he he you know I'm, i don't think it's quite fair to say i mean you could say it's fair you could argue he's quarterback too right now right and amazing he there, there's was really three games this season where you could say he played his best football of his life you could say it about really maybe four times because you have know, the second half of that tampa bay game you could talk about both New England games, and now you could say he played the best football of his life. At no point in 2020 did he play football at this level, at the level he played in that Patriots game, the level he played in that first Patriot, in second Patriots game, excuse me, right? This was just an insane level of football, and you, he is up there, and I think what makes him so unique, even compared, even more so than Patrick Mahomes, is what he can do on the ground. He's like, outside of Lamar, you could argue he's a better scrambler, a better runner than than Kyler Murray, right? That he is out. He hurt a guy. He hurt a guy in this game. He he hurt two guys in this game. He he ran over Tyron Matthew. I don't even know who the other guy he hurt was, but he was out there running over dudes. How many quarterbacks in the NFL can run like that? He was the, I think he was clocked as the second fastest uh, GPS time in the playoffs this season at 20 something miles an hour, right? Just insane cartoonish level stuff. And, you know, I think what you really saw in these last couple of games too, was finally putting together the deep ball, the under, not yep. that he had it before, but you finally saw a 75 yard pass that had 59 air yards on it. I don't, I, that's what I call I don't know if that's the actual air yard. It seemed like 59 air yards. The, you, the keeping stuff underneath. He didn't really throw a bad pass in this game. He didn't throw an interceptable ball. At least to me, it didn't seem like he had any turnover worthy throws, right? Constantly in the last two games, he made every decision he made seemed to be the exact right decision. And just, I, I've never seen a, a Bills quarterback play like that. And, and really, I, I, one of the reasons why, I'm so sad about this game is that performance. And I said the same thing after the Tampa Bay regular season game, those performances are going to get lost to history. And they really were just such fantastic performances, but same time, it it gives you a little bit of hope. Yeah. I mean, the way I've said, said with Josh Allen, I mean, he's, he's an elite passer with Cam Newton mobility. I mean, that's really what he kind of is. He's some sort of morph of, you know, Brett Favre and Cam Newton into, into a single player. I mean, he, yeah, he's, he took himself, Ryan, from being a pretty good quarterback or very good quarterback to being a amazing quarterback. I mean, he's no undoubtedly top five elite company. And all that's left for him is just to start winning and some accolades. And I think he'll be really entrenched in there. But for me, the MVP I'll go with, which is the other obvious answer here. I mean, it's Gabriel Davis. Gabriel Davis was un freaking believable in this game i mean unbelievable and it, of course initially makes you question what what the hell is he doing not in the lineup for half the season you know what were they doing trying to out sanders over this guy but 
listen, better late than never. And 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 Davis has now shown Ryan at this point. And you and me were both we liked Dave Gabe Davis, but we never really thought of him truly as being wide receiver two. I think you and me can eat some crow on that happily. Gabe Davis is wide receiver two to Stephon Diggs, hands down. He needs to be a huge part of this offense moving forward because Gabe Davis just gives them vertical speed down the field. His route running has gotten so much better. I mean, that route he put on, I think it was Mike Hughes, where he just took that man's soul was utterly ridiculous. And Gabe Davis, say what you want, but Gabe Davis plays big in big moments. I mean, people forget in that Colts game, if Gabe Davis just makes some of those toe-tap catches, the Bills don't win that game. I mean, he he. This is a guy that's delivered for them in these big moments before. So, I, I, I he was incredible. He broke NFL playoff records on, on on Sunday night, and I'm looking forward to see what he can do building off of this because for him, he's real talented. And and although I I, I don't want to say the sky's the limit for him, but Gabe Davis can be an excellent receiver in this in the, in the NFL for such a long time. And you know, I, I put it out from the show account that I think we were both a little bearish on his his potential of outside of being number three. Like I, I think at least me, you know, I was on record this season as saying if he's your number three, great. If he's number if he's your number two, not so great. He looks like a guy who get a thousand yards, right? He when you use him and I'm not gonna go as far to say like I, I think we're doing a little bit of revisionist history. Oh, why was Sanders out there so much, right? But I, I think it was reasonable. Especially early on, Sanders had a good start to the season at the you know that he helped them win a couple games. Um but I think you could pencil him in the number two next year. Obviously, you know, if you draft a guy in the first round, that changes. But he really looks like a stud. And, you know, Judge tweeted it out, the, that that old, and I think it was timely, that that draft video they had of Bean watching him and saying, you know, I hope he runs slow because he plays fast. And he really is an elite deep ball receiver. He's not super fast, but his long speed is as good as anyone in the National Football League. And really an all-time special game. And I will make a side note here. You know, I, I saw some stuff, you know, where was Diggs? Where was Diggs? Having Diggs allows him to have the game like that, right? They put so much emphasis, so much bracketing, so much effort into stopping Diggs that it allows a guy with a talent like Gabe Davis to go off for 201 and four touchdowns, a playoff record. And once again, upsetting because that's going to get lost to time a little bit, right? If they win this game, that is a all-time, forever-remembered playoff performance. And that's what makes me sad. That's another reason why it just makes me sad that there's so many cool things that happened in this game that I really think that we're just going to kind of forget forget happened, or at least maybe not us because we watched the game, but I, I think over time just we'll kind of get brushed under the table. And now we go into an off season, and, you know, we – we talked a lot about this game, so we're going to save, I think, some of these thoughts for the next two, you know, next show or two coming up. But there's a couple pressing issues that I think we right. should talk about because by the time we record next week, they might both be gone or there'll be a significant change in the situation. And it's kind of surprising that we're now in, you know, I commend the, all the NFL teams right now. We are at going into NFC championship weekend or conference championship weekend, and no coaches have been hired yet. And actually, actually, there's been more openings since Black Monday than there have. Sean Payton just left today, which, first of all, I'm going to pause there for a second. What a funny yeah. way to quit. I think Robert <laughs> I think Robert Mays put it on Twitter. I'm going to paraphrase it. But it's like it, it's like if your buddy gets an Airbnb and you trash it and then leave before he gets up right, the, he paid Taysom Hill, paid all these contracts, paid Jameis Winston, saw is woke up looking at a $74 million, uh, you know, negative cap hit negative cap and he said eh, i'm out i'm done that is <laughs> hilarious and good for him good yeah. for him like i don't blame him at all i wouldn't want to fix that mess either that is hilarious i find that really funny and and uh, honestly what we have to wonder too is sean payton like i don't think he's done coaching football i think he's just i think i really right i think he looked at the saints and said oh this is a rebuild waiting to happen i'm out of here because he doesn't own that he's won them a super bowl he you know he helped build that city back from katrina i i really wonder if sean Payne is a a head coach or b winds up as an offense coordinator somewhere where, where one of these openings is inevitably going to pop up from uh coordinators being poached so no unbelievable he did that 
it's it's honestly like it came out of nowhere too. Like people talked about, I wonder if Brady's gonna retire. I don't think anyone saw this one coming at all. Um, I tip my hat to it though. What a what a what a you know. It almost it, feels like um when like players like get you know opt out of like bowl games. He just was like, this is not worth my future. I'm out of here. Well, it, it it the the only like comp I have, it, and I I think Pete Carroll's is a little bit more devious, but this is really old. I don't even this this might even predate you a little bit, Mitch. But when Pete Carroll left. USC he was you know if you're younger USC was really good at at mm-hmm. one time and maybe Lincoln Riley will make it good again but when he left he left and when they were getting a ton of sanctions they were getting in a lot of trouble and then he was like eh, I'm out and it feels kind of like that um what's the only comp I have for it and uh <laughs> and, you know, I, I wonder, you know, I wonder maybe he goes, you know, he could go, maybe he wants to get in front of offices too, right? Maybe he goes Tom Coughlin right. route. He wants to be a GM, right? I, he's built some good teams over there, right? So I, I don't think mm-hmm. it's the worst idea in the world, but I just thought that was really, I think that was really funny and, and good for him. I, I don't think, you know, yeah. he's, he's done a lot for that organization, whatever. But I, I think the first thing I want to talk about when we're looking at our coaching situation next year mm-hmm. is, you know, I don't know how this is going to change. Frazier's opportunities and now with another job on the market there's a lot of jobs out there and and I think there is you know there's going to be an emphasis and I'll put it boldly I think there's going to be an emphasis on teams from the league I think there's going to be leagues the league pushing to hire black coaches like I'll put that bluntly I think last week I last year I think was a really big black eye for the league you know, David Culley having a good year and getting a good year for what was expected of that team getting fired. There's only one black coach in the league right now and Mike Tomlin. Right. Like that, the league doesn't want that. And and that's not me being that that's just me being what the league sees right now, right? It's an image thing for yes. us. And so they're gonna want. So, you know, I, I don't know where he, he's more wanted right now, but regardless, let, let's play a game. Let's let, let's live in a hypothetical world where he doesn't get a job for some reason, right? Which I think is, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons not to hire him. He's old. He just put that in that performance, whatever. If he doesn't get a job, do you think it's time, even as someone who's a good defensive coordinator to maybe bring in a new face, especially as you look at a defensive coordinator market that has Wink, uh, Wink Martindale out there and, and Vic Fangio and, you know, Mike Zimmer, and, you know, some guys who would be a little bit of a different voice on this team. Do, do you want Frazier back if he doesn't get a job? I So I, I think I want Frazier back because ultimately he has, you know, now five years of having successful defenses for the most part for the Bills. I mean, the worst they finished under with, with, with him as their DC is like middle of the pack. Um, that being said, though, I, I am starting to get to a point, Ryan, where I am concerned that Frazier sort of has hit his ceiling as a defensive coordinator, that he really can't do any more than what he's done. And I'm not sure that what he's done is quote-unquote enough. I mean, maybe it's more just his style. I mean, he he tends to be a bit of a conservative defensive coordinator. You know, he's gotten more aggressive, but I mean, he's gone in fits where he hasn't really blitzed a lot, where he's played a bit and he's been a little bit vanilla. So I'm kind of 50 50 on it because, you know, the grass isn't always greener, right? I mean, it does, just because they get a different voice in there doesn't mean it's the right voice. Exactly. And, I, and that's why I, I, I think I would like Leslie Frazier to return, but I don't outrule the fact that a different mindset from a defensive coordinator, a little bit more aggressive, maybe, you know, different, a slightly different philosophy than what we've seen from Leslie Frazier is a bad thing. So as much as it could be the right, the good thing for the Bills to maybe move on from Frazier, it certainly could totally backfire. So, if they want to move on from Frazier, or if he goes and gets an, a job somewhere else, um, they're going to have to be really careful who they bring in. Because I mean, look at it. I mean, you know, the Bills' defense were amazing under Jim Schwartz. They bring in Rex Ryan, who at the time was still considered a great defensive mind, just a different philosophy, and he, I mean, he was an awful fit for what they had. So, we'll see. I guess is the way I'll put it. You know, I do think I, I will give credit, right? I, I want to start with same thing. Let's just Frazier's good at his job. Okay. I don't I don't think we can get too carried away with a game against one of the historically best, most talented offenses and the most one of the most gifted offensive minds in the history of football, right? Like let 
let's start there. But I do think there are times in the life cycle of a team, right, that I think you need some fresh ideas. And, you know, whether that's bringing in a guy who might blitz more, maybe it's not even bringing in maybe a defensive coordinator, right? Bringing, bringing someone into this building to, to change the conversation, right? You know, it, it can become an echo chamber sometimes. I'd be like, you, you stay at the same job too long. You hang around with the same people for a while, right? You kind of settle in to a kind of way when you bring new people into your friend group, right? Sometimes you try new things. When you bring someone new into work, you get a new boss, they change things up. So maybe it's worth when you see how this defense has gotten dismantled tw- in two straight years by Kansas City. You know, it, I think it's a worthwhile conversation. And, you know, Frazier, let's say Frazier, is, he's, you know, 62, I think now, right? He's getting up there in age. And I think it's worth, you know, especially with a guy like Wink Martindale out there, Vic Fangio, who's kind of been the father of, of this two shell defense, you know, two high safety defense that the entire league is running now. You know, like Zimmer, I don't know if he's a culture fit, but a guy who who would definitely be a unique voice on this team. And and you know, he's not he's not, you know, frankly, he's not the the biggest uh players coach in the world. Tyler Dunn has an interesting article about that on Go Long, but like I wouldn't be upset either way. I, I think it's I understand wanting to bring in a new just a new voice into this organization. And speaking into debating bring into a new voice, the other guy who I think is definitely gonna be gone on one team or another, it's gonna be Brian Dable. And Josh Allen put his voice yesterday, essentially, without putting his his name out there, but put his voice to essentially wanting Ken Dorsey to be this next offensive coordinator. And I think one of the places I have disagreed, I, my, my biggest disagreement I think I've ever had now with, with the wonderful guys over at air raid hour is I really want to, I am excited. This as much as I love Brian Dable. I'm excited to see Ken Dorsey take over this team. And at least it seems like, right. It seems like he's a guy who's being going to take this job. When you look at that spot, is that who you want to take the job? Do you see names out there that may interest you more? Do you think it's worthwhile bringing in someone from the outside? How do you feel about the future of this offensive coordinator spot? Honestly, um, I I would love if Ken Dorsey got the job. I already kind of felt that um, before Josh Allen said what he said, but once Josh Allen essentially gave his endorsement, to Ken, uh, you know, unofficially said, you know, basically, I want Ken Dorsey. Um, Whatever Josh wants is what I want. Because at the end of the day, that's the most important guy on your team. And if at this point, too, I mean, Ken Dorsey's been around for a little bit. You know, he's, I trust that he has his own kind of philosophy for coaching that could work. Um, it, it, unless the Bills have some grand plan to like get like Sean Payton, right? Who we just talked about as their OC, go for Ken Dorsey. Um, however, I know there are some rumors that if Brian Dable gets the Giants job, He's going to try to have Ken Dorsey come with him to be the offensive coordinator there, which personally, I think for Ken Dorsey, I don't know why you would make well, that well, decision. Like, like why, I don't know why you thing. would. Like, because the, the, the my whole issue with, the, I think the reason why that's so confusing is because you can be, like, you assume, right, if he's an offensive coordinator with the Giants, he's not calling plays. He's going to get stuck with Daniel Jones or Mitch Trubisky. One good year calling plays. Like, he's going to call plays here. One good year with Josh Allen calling plays. He could be a head coach in 2023. Right. No, I agree. And I think, I think, why would you not like, why would you to what, if you're going to get the same position at both teams, why would you not stick with a team that's got a great quarterback, a great, you know, a few good, a few really good receivers, you know, some good old linemen versus the giants, which you know, is going to be just an, a, a total rebuild. So I, I personally don't exactly understand that unless the giants are offering him a shit ton of money, which in that case, I mean, Hey, he could go that route. But if he doesn't get the job, Ryan, I'll just say this. If, Dave, if, if, if Dorsey goes with Dable or whatever, the next guy on the list, I, I'd like, I, I'm the way you feel about Dorsey, I have a little bit of me that kind of wants to see if Chad Hall could step into that role because the players love him. And I believe he is technically 
uh, maybe I'm getting confused with Dorsey, but I think Chad Hall is technically their passing game coordinator. That's Dor- Dorsey's, Dorsey's passing Dorsey game coordinator. Dorsey is that? Okay, okay, so I'm wrong with that. But, I mean, I think Chad Hall could be a guy that could step into that role one day. I mean, he might be a little too young and not quite ready for that kind of position, which, again, you hope if they have Dorsey to kind of groom Chad Hall, and it turns into a little bit of a, you know, sort of pipeline there. But, um, but I'd like to see, I'd, I'd like to see Ken Dorsey because the players like him. He has Josh Allen's full trust. He's played a huge role in his development. He's played a huge role in Cam Newton's development. Like, I believe the guy's a really great coach and is ready to finally kind of go up the rungs of the ladder a little bit. So, for me, if you're the Bills, I think you got to do everything you can to make sure Ken Dorsey doesn't go anywhere other than office coordinator for the Buffalo Bills. And my concern, too, is if Ken Dorsey does become OC, is that McDermott's going to lean on some of his connections. Who's the guys he's coached with? Matt Nagy. Don't want that. Yep. Uh, what's the other name I had in my like, uh, Doug North Peterson, Turner. right? Yeah, yeah. You know, Doug Peterson, another guy he has connections with. I don't want a retread, right? I I am right. willing to take a risk on someone, right? Too men, too often teams just go back to kind of known names, both offense and defense. And give right. me someone who's fresh. Give me someone who's ambitious. Give me someone who who is trying to prove something. And and you know, to, to put a bow on the conversation, I I just think someone who's been in Josh's year. And it's not like, you know, it's one thing if you look at some of these guys who rise the offensive coordinator too fast. I kind of like that was kind of Dable's situation early in his career when he became offensive coordinator in the Browns, right? You're you're a quarterback coach, and then all of a sudden the offensive coordinator gets fired and you're calling play, right? That's not the case with him, right? He's been an offensive coordinator, uh, excuse me, a quarterback coach for a bunch of years now under d- different systems, developed two quarterbacks, like you said. And he's been, he's interviewed for jobs. We forget he interviewed for our OC job in the same cycle Dable got interviewed, right? So we forget that. So you know that he's been, he's been, you know, whatever the preparation is for becoming an OC, he's been doing it. So I, I'm excited. I, 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 once again, I have no evidence. We have no evidence that he's going to be good. We have no evidence of what his offense would look like, how similar or different it would be to Dable. But I said yesterday, you know, I said yesterday on Twitter, just just vibes. I get good vibes from Ken Dorsey, right? Maybe mm-hmm. he's just maybe he's just a good looking dude. Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, I I don't know. I just right. I, I've always have I always have I've had good vibes from him, but you know, and, put and, a and on top of that, Ryan. Yeah, and, and, and on top of that, Ryan too. I mean, we talked about with the with the DC. Maybe it's time to like kind of get just a fresh voice in there, and maybe like listen. I know Dable's been really good, but we, you know, we talked about some of the things he does that we don't love. I mean. Listen, maybe Ken Dorsey is a kind of a breath of fresh air for the offense and, and add some things that are a little different that could benefit him. I mean, you never know unless you give him a chance. So, yeah, I I, I, I think it'd be fun to see, you know, what he could do in that position. And the kind of preview what's going to happen going forward here. Let's let, let's do a quick preview of what we see with this team and we can kind of use it to mm-hmm. lead, in, lead into our next couple episodes here. What do we want? to see from this offseason and whether it's free agency, whether it's the draft. When you look at players you want to add to this team, what are your three spots you are looking at? What are the three position or three three units that you're looking at that you most want to improve on this roster? So I, I didn't even really even go units in this. I kind of took this in a little bit of a different direction and in, in, in a sense, I guess. But for me, like the number one thing I need to see this team do are the off season is this team needs to get faster. They need to get faster. I'm not talking down the field, like, like John Brown, go, go route speed. They need guys that can make plays after the catch of this offense, whether it's out of the backfield in the, in the slot out wide, just at all those levels, they need guys who can catch the ball and make plays once they catch it. To me, the only guy that consistently is making plays after he catches the ball is Stephon Diggs. And it's kind of been that way for a decent amount of time. And I saw that the Bills are second to last in the league in yard in average yards per catch or yards after the catch. That's got to get better. I mean, I'm not saying it needs to be Tyreek Hill level because Tyreek Hill, again, as I said, he's one of one. That that guy just, you know, guys like him don't grow on trees. But the Bills need to get guys in this offense that are dynamic catching the ball and are equally as dynamic after they catch the ball. And as of right now, they just don't have enough guys. It's all in Allen getting them the ball and, and throwing them open. And, you know, they're lacking that ability just to get guys in space and have them go. So to me, and the Chiefs kind of open 
or my eyes to it really how how important to have you and i'm not saying you need to have a whole receiving core that but you need to have a handful of guys that can do that um so for me that is like number one need i i, I think they have to address this offseason is just get faster on offense because they have a lot of guys who are quick but they don't have necessarily a lot of explosive guys yeah yeah and you know that 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 really and you look at a team like Kansas City who does jack really well and you know getting the speed my big three is I think you know I've been a defender of Levi Wallace but I, I think this is the year you got you cannot let Levi Wallace and, and these slow DBs yep be the reason you lose more football games right and they're good I think Levi Wallace it will get what has played out of our price range I think he'll end up getting paid somewhere next year and I'm happy for him. He's a good DB, good so cornerback too. But I think it's time when when this team that you keep running into, this rock that you keep running into is Kansas City, it's time to go back and invest resources into cornerback. Whether that's free agency, whether that's draft, it's time to get some, put some speed, put some athletes in this secondary. And once again, that's exactly what I wrote. Raz score does not dictate how good of a cornerback you're going to be. But when the two cornerbacks in this game have RAS scores of like one. I don't know if that's the actual, but really low RAS scores, you know, low 40, and you don't RAS score, a relative athletic score uh, by Ken LaPlante over uh, at SB Nation. Um, I, that, that's an issue. And it was an issue the last two years on this team. So DB, and, you know, it doesn't even have to be cornerback, right? Fine. I, I love, I love the Tyron Matthews, the Minka Fitzpatricks, the Buddha Bakers of the world. I would, they are my favorite type of defensive play. You can get a guy like that that's just a, a rangy, positionless guy that just runs around and can cover anyone you want to cover. And those guys don't grow on trees, right? That's harder. Kyle Duggars of the world, right? Those guys don't grow on trees. But I, I love that type of player. I have, you know, Ryan Bates, right? He kind of secured that guard spot for us. But I don't, once again, I, that doesn't stop you from going out and getting guard. I can get better at this interior offensive line, either push him. You know, you can cut Darrell Williams. If you have find a guy who's good enough, save some money, cut John Feliciano, save some money, right? If you can find a cheap starting talent in the draft, or at least depth piece in the draft, developmental piece in the draft, right? Save some money there, right? Get better there. Mitch Morris is, is played great. I love to extend him, but he's always one concussion away from, from retiring. So get deeper get better in that interior offensive line. And I think a really big sneaky need on this team is, is wide receiver. Look at this room. You have Stefan Diggs, who's going to have to get paid either this season, definitely next season. He is criminally underpaid. He is 19th highest paid wide receiver. I'm sure once Chris Godwin hits the market this season, if Devontae Adams hit the market this season, he's going to keep on falling down that board. Um, So get him. So he, you have him, you have Gabe Davis, and you know it's reasonable to want to move on from Cole Beasley, right? He's old. You can save money there. He wasn't the player he was last year, so I think that is a spot where you can stay. You've seen what pass catchers can do to a team, how they can change a team, right? I, I think that's where my thinking. Watching with Jamar Chase, not that you can find a Jamar Chase at twenty five, but you look at how he changed trajectory of that team and. If you can find like the, I keep saying it, I mean, not to get too in the minutia of, of all this, but if Jamison Williams falls at 25 somehow, I'll red shirt Jamis, Jamison Williams. That that's a wildly good tail, right? Jahan Doxson from Penn yep. State, right? I, I don't think wide receiver at, at 25 is an awful, awful decision. So I, I think you need to get younger, get cheaper in that why in that pass catcher room because there's Dawson Knox's contract coming up too as well, right? So Getting cheaper, getting younger in that wide receiver room, I, I I think is a sneaky, really big need for this team. Yeah, I I agree with everything you said, and and that was kind of my whole like speed thing was just yeah, and that that was my main thought was get more speed in the receiving core. Um, the only other thing, and I also wrote same thing, better athletes in the secondary. They they need to get more athletic there. The only thing that I wrote on my kind of three needs of the off season that um that 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 uh, you also didn't have in your notes for me was um was they need to get up. They need to get, I mean, I hate to say because they've invested so goddamn much in this specific position, but they, they need to get a real presence at pass rusher coming off the edge, like a real 
Like not, oh, we got a whole bunch of dudes you can rotate in. You need to, they need to get a dude who you know is coming in, who is demanding a double team, who can get you, you know, double digit sacks. They need to do something like that because at the end of the day, you got Jerry Hughes, who as much as I love Jerry Hughes, I wouldn't be surprised if the Bills move on from him. He really, I think, has sort of started to hit that kind of aging wall, but he wasn't quite the same player he was. AJ Epinesa for two years has been kind of invisible. Uh, he's starting to kind of creep into Cody Ford bus territory a little bit. I would like them to see them go get a, a Cam Jordan, a Daniel Hunter. Give me a veteran who I know can get after the quarterback. Bring Chandler Jones home. Yeah, bring, you know, there, there's some, you know, I, I think sometimes as fans, we get a little bit too, you know, we want to find, you know, go get this big guy, go get this. But, you know, there's, there's going to be names out there to go get this season, right? I, I, the Saints are a team that are going to be desperately trying to shred shed cap. You know, it, I think it's very plausible that they are rebuilding next year. And, right, it, at some point, right, just clean up the things, right? Ed, Ed had an amazing year. If you can couple that with someone off the edge that can – finish sacks, finish plays that can at least more consistently chase someone up into the pocket. That that's really going to change this because they're right there, right? That, that pass yep. rush is right there. One more, you know, I, I I'm always hesitant to say one more piece, right? Cause you're always, it's never one piece, but adding, if they can just find a dude on a defensive line, it is going to be going to, it, it's going to be, I think would really be massive. And, you know, once again, without getting to my minutiae, right? This is a team that, when I look at it, when I look at this roster and I, I look at the state of this roster, right? A lot like that. Third, we're not losing a ton this off season, and I think you look at every any position unit. I think you take out quarterback and offensive tackle. I think those are the only two spots on this team that you look at and you say, we don't need to add anything, anything there. We're fine. Everything else on this team. I think you look at and and safety, but like I said, you can find other types of players for that spot. But I think you look at this roster and you can look at any position unit and say, yeah, that's good, but they can get better. Right. And, and I think that's a really good place to be and a really healthy place to be. And, and I think the way I want to kind of wrap this episode up for those of you that are still listening is this sucked on, on yeah. Sunday. It stinks. It stinks getting that close. It stinks knowing that whoever won that game was probably going to the Super Bowl. And I watch as I say that Cincinnati is going to win that game somehow. But go back. If you have time, go back and listen to the show we did with Bruce in over the summer. And he had a really good point that talking about how Super Bowl or bust mindset isn't healthy. Not Maybe not healthy is the right word, but isn't productive, isn't realistic, right? We should build it. You build a team to be as good as possible as long as possible. It is so hard to win a Super Bowl. You know, this isn't basketball. This isn't hockey. This isn't baseball. You get one game, you know, one game to win, right? You don't get series. You don't get series to prove that you're the better team. That's why it's so hard. That's why it's important to build rosters that can go year after year after year after year after year. And if you're feeling down, the only thing I can tell you is this roster is built to be good for a while. Not just because quarterback, because we have players in key position, because we have an elite cornerback, because we have a franchise left tackle, because we have a franchise wide receiver. This is a roster that is built to go back, and this team will go back to the playoffs next year, barring playoffs. So I, I think if you want to be optimistic, I'm natural. I think I've always been naturally a more optimistic Bills fan than most. So I'm going to put that message out there. Be positive. Um, it's now Wednesday when you hear that. So hopefully as you're listening to this, everything's kind of dissipated and you're back to homeostasis about everything. And uh, I, I think now that the dust is settled, I'm, I'm feeling, I won't say good about the off season, but I've, I've made my peace. And that is a perfect way, I think, to wrap up this episode so thank you guys so much for listening to the 585 report uh, we really appreciate it uh your support throughout the whole season it's been awesome doing this um you know now we have a, a full off season 
to to get into to really start you know doing the mock drafts again looking at the you know who's going to be a free agent and although that's right now maybe not what people want to hear you know it's give it some time we'll start to get excited about the stuff uh, as as bills fans always do so um yeah thank you for listening guys we'll we'll keep you posted this for always as far as you know what what things are look like the off season with our show um and with that being said thank you it's been a pleasure and we'll see you this off season